Hi everybody, this is legendary pinball designer Steve Ritchie. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Atari once had a pinball division. Uh, we covered it here in the chapter called Balls of Steel. <laughs> and uh, Steve actually got his start there. Uh, this is, by the way, this is your copy of the book. Thank you very much. Uh, what we're going to do now... Remember, this is, this, is, this is the legendary Steve Ritchie, whose boss told him he, he was not a, a, a pinball designer. <laughs> I don't really know what he said. Can you pass that on? Yeah, he basically said uh, that you, when you started your career, they gave you some flack. Uh, your boss tried to say you weren't a pinball designer, and he didn't want you to... Later. Actually, I went to Atari in 1974. I was employee number 50. I would say the greatest moment in Atari's history was the day Andy Capps came to our, uh, you know, representative from this bar, <clears throat> came to our office and said, hey, our pawn's not working anymore. So we went out there and, uh, you know, it's like, there were so many quarters in the game and it filled the bucket, filled the cabinet, all the way up to the coin switches, they couldn't move. That's what happened. And without Pong, the rest of it would not have followed. It was, it was just a coin operated hit on a mega level. And another thing that I think about when you were speaking of, uh, about the computers, Bert, yeah, VCS was really cool, but I think they really stepped it up. Like on the 1040 ST, I had one of those, I loved it, I had this many games, I had these, it was awesome. Anyway, I love that system, and I think they came up with it because other people, other manufacturers, computers, were nice, and there were some great games out there, and they wanted to make some great games also. But, um, other things that I remember. Um, wow, okay. Well, let's go over how you actually... I don't know if anybody told you the story. When I went to work, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was 1974, like April. They, I came out of the Coast Guard as an electronics technician. I was put right to work doing electromechanical work. I had some electrical experience and a little electronic experience, but fixing radar and Loran systems and UHF radios, not, not video games. So they stuck me on the line every day, uh, not every day, every Friday, okay, my boss, who always wore a white shirt, Okay, and a tie and a coat would bring in this tray wrapped with aluminum foil and place it on the end of the tech bench. And basically it was hash brownies, okay? <laughs> so everyone in the factory, I mean everyone, even the people in the offices. But this is Nolan Bush now, he was, you know, it was actually a great place to work. <laughs> we used to have a radio station called KOME, you know, and they knew we'd be listening and they'd make comments to people at Atari. Stereo everywhere you go in the factory. And their, their thing was like, you've got cum on your radio, but don't wipe it off. <laughs> anyway, some other things that happened at Atari were, out, you know, that was outrageous. I mean, it might be outrageous from a Midwestern standpoint, from, from the West Coast, it was wild. <laughs> what was going on there, it was like totally insane. But, um, you know, uh, as, as we moved from uh, the first place on uh, Lark Avenue, out of Nolan's garage first, and then, you know, they worked on everything for, what, seven months before I got there, I think, pretty much. So I'm employee number 50. After two years of, of making things for them, I did that big orange test fixture that played yeah. all, the, all the games. I did that, and I also did their burning ovens, um, like 100 boards at a time, using plus bar, a quarter inch by an inch wide, and bury outs, and now, uh, what is it, asbestos, you know, shielded wire. I touched that stuff, God. Anyway, uh, did that. They finally invited me to be in the pinball division. I uh, I was the second employee, the first employee when the guy they stole from Chicago, uh, a, guy named, a guy named Bob Jonesy, who really did show me how to lay out a pinball machine, how they worked, and told me every day how we would never, ever build a successful pinball machine. It's just not going to happen. Every day he would tell us that. And he was kind of right. It took him so long. And it's like, we did everything wrong. No one wanted rotary solenoids. The rest of the world was doing linear, and they were working. Ours weren't working. It was horrible. The first two or three games were just, you know, really miserable to live with. Um, but finally, with Superman, we were able to convince someone that he should make games like everybody else does with linear solenoids. Um, other experiences, my boss would not let me be a game designer, so 
I kind of went to Nolan and said, look, I drew this up at my house and I really want to be a pinball designer. And he said, okay, yeah, you're a pinball designer. And he got me a cubic roll on the drafting table and I began to work as a pinball designer. It was great. Uh, do you have any other questions? Anybody about that era? Sure. Uh, does anybody have any questions for him? Okay. What are some of the pinballs that you worked on? What are some of the pinballs that you worked on? Okay, my first game was Airborne Avenger. Uh, it's like, I don't know if you know who Roger Sharp is, he used to write a column called the Critics Corner. Airborne Avenger was a spell out on the game, and he said, wow, that's a mouthful. It's a lot of letters, it was, it was ridiculous. It's like evidence of a punk who knows nothing trying to make a pinball machine. Okay. My second game was Superman, and it did much better. But they didn't build it until well after I accepted an offer to go to Williams in Chicago. And I had already made it back to Flash, I think, and uh, Stellar Wars. That was out also. We were building both of them. And then Superman. So it was kind of cool because they had you know, one, two, and three in the arcade. And right. switch around. It was uh, a once in a lifetime thing. Did you have a favorite machine of yours from that time period? Say it again, please. Did you have a favorite uh, machine from that time period that you did? Yeah. Now, I'm not in love with wide bodies. It's really, really hard to make play good. Superman played pretty good in the end. Uh, other games, we got a little narrower. You know, like Indiana Jones and Star Trek the Next Generation, much easier to make a good game. You know, with that width and that geometry. Okay. Uh, when Atari Pinball Division was closed down, was it something you could see coming? I was long gone. Okay. I got an offer to go to uh, to Williams for twice the money, but I had to pack up my life in California, which was a hard thing to do. You know, in California, the weather's nice every day. Okay. <laughs> if, if, on any day you plan to do something, it's probably going to come on. You know? It's probably going to be a nice day, and you'll be able to, you know, have your event or do whatever you want to do. It's, it's hard to beat. I'm going to shut up after this, but it's hard to beat. The ocean, the mountains, the desert, I mean, <clears throat> the lakes, it's just a beautiful place. It's sort of like, I don't know, <clears throat> I think a lot of people think it's, I think they think it's L.A., but L.A. is like the armpit. <laughs> San Francisco is getting better, but you go, you go east or north, and it's beautiful. Not that Wisconsin is, is it? I mean, I, I like Wisconsin. It is a beautiful state. I'm not just making it up. It's pretty. <laughs> So, would you would it be fair to say then that uh, you did a lot of learning on the job when you were doing the pinballs at, uh, when you were at Atari? Would it be fair to say I did not hear the next that you were doing a lot of learning and understanding on the job? No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anybody that ever made a, a good pinball machine in their first house. Maybe John Trudeau. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Are there, I mean, are there any other favorite stories from when you were there during that time period that you think people would be interested in hearing? It's not my favorite because it's totally, it's anti what the rest of the world thinks, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Every morning, I would have to walk by Steve Jobs, okay? And he wore the same t-shirt every day and shorts and sandals. He had a, he had a, a, a bottle, of, I didn't care about it, but he had carried tea. On it. I, I mean, he wasn't a hippie. He was like, I don't know what he was, okay? <laughs> but smelled terrible, I would say. He, he was an engineer, and I, I was I was just a, a, a you know, supervisor of the pinball prototype lab. But it's like, he was God. I would say, good morning. He would never say one word to me. Ah! <laughs> That's me, all right? Sorry, Steve. Hey, you died young. I wonder why. <laughs> you know, he was kind of mean. He was kind of mean to everybody. And if you haven't read the book, you need to. <laughs> anyway, uh, he and, and Steve Wozniak is the exact opposite. Okay. Steve, that Steve's going to hell. Woz is going to hell. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He's a great guy. And he, they together were working on um, Breakout which a lot of us recognize as totally fun, like, uh, it was awesome, it was a great game, it was like the next best game, and revelation after Pong in the video game business, it really was, and uh, you know, you could just tell everybody wanted to play it. 
we would wait until Steve Jobs wasn't there and most of the time he just had his feet on the desk. Um, it would have been good if he just would have stayed home, you know? <laughs> and uh, we'd, we'd wait till he wasn't there and then go talk to Steve. It's okay if we play it. We'd play it for a few minutes and, and go. Anyway, that's my brush with not so greatness. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, not so greatness. If you don't have time to be a human being to other human beings around you, I don't have time for you. To <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> that's very good. That's very good. Um, any lessons on pinball design that you still carry with you to this day that you formulated back then, or any insight that you still use to this day? Well, there are some things, but they're pretty minor. I mean, pinball, I, I try to evolve pinball. I have my own style, and people here that play know that, and it's like, I, uh, I, I learned a lot that's, that I still utilize, but I also, I try not to go back there. Some of the things are just standard, you're stuck with them forever, okay. like a ball drive. But, you know, as far as new ideas, I try not to look back, I try to look forward, come up with some new features for every game. And, uh, you know, I, I will say <clears throat> that a lot of guys have influenced me. Uh, Greg Commit definitely influenced me with Captain Fantastic with this upper flipper. Uh, it didn't impress me with these two down here, the scissor flipper from the left. The upper right clip was definitely, you know, influenced me into doing some stuff with Flash and, uh, and, and uh, other games where I had an upper right clipper uh, and maybe, you know, adding the continuous ability to loop and things like that. Uh, I have favorite games from every game kind of pretty much. Well, how about the opposite side of that coin? Uh, anything that you're embarrassed about from back then? You, you think, what was I thinking? What I'm embarrassed about? Yeah. Well, there's a hole on Airborne Avenger that you can't draw a straight line from the flipper to the hole. Okay. Like, I don't know what that is about. I, I never liked games that did that. It's like brain damage. And then another another thing on Airborne Avenger around that hole is a you know a piece of metal, and the ball bumps into it, and make sure that the ball will not stay in the hole. Make sure every time. Okay. Unless you get really lucky and roll in at zero velocity. My state. So these, these are goofy things that, uh, you know, I never did that again. Somebody had to point it out to me, that's even worse. Uh, so I, I was 25 years old. <laughs> well, speaking of that Division two, I mean, besides Eugene, who you, you obviously still talk to, do you uh, run into anybody else from back then? Um, Keep in I touch. see Owen Rubin, I see Howie Gelman, I see, I haven't seen Ed Rothberg in a while. I haven't spoken to, um, uh, Ed, video game back, great, Asteroids, Ed, 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 um, uh, lots of guys, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, I, I've seen Steve Bristow in the last few years, okay. Al Alcorn, once they, did, they came to a pinball show, and, uh, uh, I'm still tight with a few people, uh, other, other guys that I work with, like, I had a friend, okay. <clears throat> we both worked at Atari and played in a band together. And uh, in the morning in his band, he told me to join on the way to work. <laughs> at break time, join. At noon, go out to the, go out to the band. Yeah. <laughs> Two o'clock break. <laughs> hey, all right. Oh, rock work. <laughs> Two. <laughs> okay, then we go to band practice and be <laughs> all night. And uh, the guy can play bass, incredible. He, he, I, mean, I don't know how he understand all that THC, but he did. I guess he didn't feel it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Yes. What was the uh, project or the moment when you realized that you were going to do this for a living and for, you know, it was Airborne Avenger because I, I knew I could do it, you know. I just didn't know how all the way. And uh, but with Superman, I I thought, yeah, well, at Superman, I, I did four Whitewoods on four different prototypes because I couldn't get it. I just couldn't get it right. But the fourth one was good, and uh, so it kind of rocked from there. And uh, then we started experimenting with, uh, you know, an Echoplex is. It's like a poor man's echo unit it has a chase loop and change distance between the heads and uh, change how fast it is. 
slap back. So one day I brought that to work and I just hooked it up to our audio system on Superman. And it was continuous sound. It was like cool. You know? I don't know. I thought it would be great. This feels good. If it was more controlled, it would be cool. Uh, they hated it, but I, I went to I went to uh, Stern. I'm sorry, Williams, um, and Williams. Uh, they let us do it, and it was on a game that sold almost 20,000 machines in the, the first background sound. They kind of built up and pitch and everything. I don't know. It was an exciting thing then, and the flash lamp was invented for that too. Anybody else? That <laughs> uh, was your chance. Okay, uh, that's about all we have time for then. And I want to thank you very much. Right, thanks a lot for asking to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I already got it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. So, uh, that's about all we have time for. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be switching over the table over there.